Father. It is wonderful to be in the house of God. It is wonderful not to be in a hospital. It is wonderful not to be in a jail or in a hurricane or a tornado or on a sick bed, dying of cancer. So we need to be thankful every day of our lives that God is God and saw us, loved us, and set us free. And for whom the Lord sets free is free indeed. And because God has set you free, and many of you watching right now by television or the internet or listening, you need to know that you are favored of God, blessed of God if you were in the kingdom. But not everybody is in the kingdom of God. There's a whole lot of people that still need to make that most important decision. You see, until you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are literally in the kingdom of Satan. Now, that's hard to believe that you're in the kingdom of Satan. But the truth is, if you're not in the kingdom of God, there is no other place for you to be except in the kingdom of Satan. So just going to church and being a good person and doing right things is not going to get you in the kingdom of God. It's good that you're a good person. It's good that you do good things and do great things and give your money away and help people with food and clothing. But unless you have Jesus, you're still in the kingdom of Satan. And God said he gives us a choice. The wonderful thing I love about our Savior is he doesn't force anybody. Come on, let me ask you all a question. How would you like it if your husband or your wife or your children only loved you for, um, because they were programmed to love you? No, you wouldn't like it. You wouldn't want somebody to love you because they've been wound up like a little toy doll. I love you. I love you. You want to know that they really, really love you. So that's why God gives us a free choice. We can choose Jesus. Or we can stay the way we are. We can choose as Christians. Oh, you're all saying, oh, she's talking to the unsaved. No, no, no. We can choose as Christians to stay at the same level. And the devil loves it when we just stay at the same level for year after year after year. Because then he can just kind of like knock you off and say, eh, they're not a threat to the kingdom of God. They're at the same level they were five years ago. So they get you into a la 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 bye, la la bye, in a little sleeping mode. And then they don't bother you so much. And they go bother the ones that are on the front lines. They go bother the ones that are aggressive. They go bother the ones that want to start a TV station to reach millions of people. They want to they wanna harass people that want to go to the orphanages and, and do crusades and, and do miracle services and set up tents and take their cities. That's the truth. So we need to know that we've been delivered out of the kingdom of Satan. And we've been delivered into the kingdom of God. Therefore, we need to do kingdom business for the king of kings and the Lord of lords because he is our king. Turn with me into Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. I'm going to be preaching out of Hebrews most of the night or maybe all of the night, I think. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Turn with me. All of you that are watching, grab your Bibles. Get your iPads out or whatever, however you're going to look it up or on your iPhone or, or your whatever. Just get it so you can get in the word with us tonight. All right. And somebody's just getting ready to walk away. So come back to the screen and watch. I don't know. The Holy Spirit just told me somebody was walking away. So come back. Sit down. God's got a word for you. He's got a word for you, sir. You've been running from God for years. And he's saying it's time for you to stop playing games and get serious because if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. And so sit down. I don't know what that's all about, but the Holy Spirit told me that somebody, that's for you, sir, and you're about 20, 25, 26, 7 years old. And the Lord just told me there's two or three other people that are watching. There's a lady named Martha, you're watching, and there's a guy named Earl watching, and the same words for you. Hebrews chapter 2. 
I'm, and verse 1. Therefore, we must give more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through the angels prove, prove steadfast, and even, wait a minute, I lost my place. First chapter, verse 2. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and even every transgression and disobedience re just reward, how much, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him? Now I'm going to stop there and say something. He is saying here, if the angels in heaven did not get away with being disobedient, are you hearing me? If the angels in heaven did not get in trouble, they got in trouble for being disobedient. Are you following me? And, and because they rebelled, because Lucifer got one third of the angels to rebel in heaven, are you all following with me? They received a just reward. And they were cast out of heaven. And the Lord saying to us, if, if he punished them for being disobedient, he will also not lightly not challenge us because you see, we have a mandate from God. It is not like this. It is not tell somebody about Jesus if you feel good today. Are you hearing me? It is not uh, a choice that you get to choose if you want to preach this gospel. The Bible said, go into all the world and preach this gospel. And signs and wonders and miracles will follow you. It's not if you feel like it, if you have enough money to do it, if you have enough time to do it, if you're young enough to do it, old enough to do it, I don't care what. You cannot make excuses when you stand before God. You can make excuses to Pastor Yeager. You can make excuses to your pastors. You can make excuses to yourself. But the truth of the matter is one day we will stand before the God of, of all gods, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, and he will say, what did you do with my gospel? What did you do with my plan of salvation? How many people did you talk to? How many people did you pray for? Didn't you know that I gave you all power and all authority? That you didn't have to do anything. I gave you my name. I gave you my authority. I gave you my power. I gave you all the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I empowered you on the day of Pentecost when you received the power of the Holy Spirit, and start speaking in tongues, I empowered you with dynamite power that you can change a city, change a nation. What did you do with it? I'm, ser I'm serious. You're probably all saying, some of you here know me. Whoa, Sister Joan, you're pre preaching a little. Hmm. It's time to, hmm. It's not time to play games anymore. Can't you see the world's going upside down, sideways and backwards? Can't you see people are losing their minds? If you don't know how to hear from God, you don't know. You need to be able to hear God. And if the Lord says, don't send your kids to school and don't get on the bus and don't go to the mall, don't. Because there could be some crazy person that just set a bomb or decided to shoot people up. That's why we need to hear the word of God because Satan is working, believe me. When I say this, Satan is not on vacation and Satan is not taking time off. And he is not lukewarm. Oh, am I glorifying Satan? No, I'm speaking the truth to you. I am speaking the truth to you. We are in an army and the two armies is Satan is trying to take as many people to hell and we in God's kingdom or to get as many people into the kingdom of God and we need to know how to fight the devil 
because some of us have children and some of us have people and, and some there's things happening in the spirit realm that don't need to happen. People don't need to lose their homes. They don't need to lose their minds. They don't need to lose their children. They don't need to be bound with sickness. We need to know how to put up our dukes. Marty says for me when I fight, he taught me when we first got married, he goes, honey, I'm going to teach you how to fight. And I, was, I thought he was, you know, like, What? I'm a minister of the gospel. I ain't going to fight nobody. He goes, let me tell you how to fight somebody. And he was just being funny. And I said, how? And he goes, you go like this. You put up your dukes and go, and then you punch. And I go, what's with the spitting? He goes, I don't know. That's how they taught me how to fight. But I don't fight anybody because our warfare is not by slapping people or hitting people. Our warfare is in the heavenly realms where we pull down strongholds and pull down principalities and we have power to stand in the gap and pray and fast and seek God on somebody's behalf and see chains fall off of them. But it means you have to sacrifice. Oh my God. You have to sacrifice. Yeah, turn off the TV set. Unless you're watching Christian. Leave it on. You don't need to watch reality shows. Get out in the world and you find reality. You can be the reality dog whisperer. You can be the reality of somebody's life being changed, transformed by God when you let God and God's anointing flow through you all God wants is here am I Lord I'm not sure what I'm doing half the time I, I am pretty much so but anyway what I'm saying is sometimes I don't know what I'm doing do you know what you're doing hey I'm just speaking truth to you you know God says something like this start a TV station he shows you a dream or a vision you don't have the money to do it I'm Pastor Yeager. Nope. But you see it in a vision, and then God starts speaking to you, and then it becomes reality. When God says something, you just obey and do it. God just told us that this summer we're doing many, many, many uh, mission trips, and he told me to order five truckloads of food to bring to different things. And I said, okay. And I said, um, how are we going to pay for everything and how are we going to pay for this and pay for that and pay for this and all this stuff that we're doing? And um, it doesn't matter. Don't matter that you don't have any money. Don't even matter that you might be in the hall. If God says it, that settles it. It will be a reality. And when I come back here in uh, June, I'll be telling you testimonies of how it already became a reality. And that's how God works. But look what it says here again. Verse 3, how shall we, you and me, escape if we neglect such a great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by our Lord and was confirmed by those who heard him? Now, who heard him? Who heard, who was the ones, the first ones to hear Jesus preaching the gospel? It was Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Peter. So the first ones that really learned the gospel and was being taught the gospel was the apostles. And then they, in turn, put it in the Holy Bible. Now we read their teachings and we read the words of God that now commands you and I to go and expect miracles and signs and wonders. He wants you, all of you watching, all of you listening, you have the power to change people's lives we have the power we cannot neglect it when we sit and don't do anything or we stay quiet and we don't witness to people then we are not effective you know you can be filled with dynamite power in here you can be filled up with all the gifts and all the anointing in here right in here inside of each and every one of you there are gifts and callings and ministries ministries waiting to be birthed they're already there a lot of good the dynamite does if you don't ever get a match that right now when I said that the Holy Spirit told me to remind you 
of one time that I was here at your church, Pastor. And up here at the altar, the Holy Spirit said, he put a match in your hand. Do you remember that? I don't remember what year it was, a few years ago. He said, I put a match in your hand, and you're going to take that match, and you're going to start revivals across the world. This could be the way you're doing it. This could be your, one of those things, I can't forget what they're called, where you go to torches, and you turn it on, and it goes, You know what I'm talking about? The station revival. Who knows where it's going? Flame, what'd you call them? Flamethrowers. That's good. Take that flamethrower and throw it. Light torches. Hey, if it gets too hot and you start to get burned, you get uncomfortable. I like it when people get uncomfortable. I like to preach people uncomfortable. Now go with me to verse 4. And it says in verse 4, And God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. So that what he's saying is, I'm giving you, I'm telling you, walk in signs and wonders and miracles, expect miracles. I'm giving you the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I'm giving you everything you need to go preach this gospel. So why are you neglecting it? And then it goes down and it says, I love it. Verse five, for he has not put the worlds to come of which we are speaking in subjection to angels. He didn't say to the angels, go preach this gospel. He didn't tell the angels, go lay hands on the sick. Are you hearing me? He did not tell the angels to do it. The angels of God, if Jesus said, go preach this gospel, would be the happiest angels in the world or in the universe. But he didn't give it to the angels. He gave his most precious possession. You see, the whole Old Testament leads to Jesus. The whole New Testament is about Jesus. The whole Bible focal point is one thing. Jesus Christ crucified, died, and rose again and became the seed that went into the ground so that we could be saved, that we could do the work of God that we, we, are, we are now his seed. So if he was the seed that went in the ground, if an apple seed goes in the ground, it produces apple trees. The apples on that tree will taste the same as the apple that made the seed that went in the ground. Are you following me? Same thing with the peach tree. It doesn't bring out oranges. And that peach tree is going to have peaches that are going to taste, look, and be just as juicy as the peach that... Seed came out of that planted the tree. Are you following me? Jesus planted himself in the ground. And he rose again. And he said, unless his seed fell to the ground, it wouldn't produce other seeds. So therefore, we need to ask ourselves, this gospel that we're preaching, we should be exactly like Jesus. We should taste like Jesus, look like Jesus, smell like Jesus, do everything that Jesus did. Because we're the fruit of that seed. And that's what he wants. He didn't put it in the hands of angels. If he would have put it in the hands of angels, they would have led everybody to the Lord a long time ago. They would have had so many miracles done. But he didn't. He put it in your hands and my hands because he trusted us. Come on. You know, if mom and dad are going to leave town, they find the the child that's the most mature, hopefully. And hopefully they don't do like what some of my kids did one time, throw a party while you're gone. But anyway, most mature, and they're leaving to go on vacation. They go, you take care of the house, you take care of your siblings, you take care of everything because they trust you. God is saying, I'm, Jesus said, I'm leaving, I'm going back to the Father. I'm going to be at the right hand of the Father ever making intercession for you. And I'm trusting you with my gospel. I'm trusting you that you will spread this gospel, lift up Jesus, pray for the sick, cast out devils, freely you receive, freely give, 
do it on my behalf because I will be with you. I'll never leave you, never forsake you. I'll be there with you always. So he's trusting you and I. And if he's trusting us that much with something so precious, there's nothing more precious. Nothing. Nothing in this world more precious than a soul. Nothing. What if God would have said, oh, oh, let's see. I'm going to have you get saved. I want you in my kingdom, but I don't want you in my kingdom. Well, no, I want you in my kingdom, but I don't want her in my kingdom. That wouldn't be a very, God, very good God. That would not be a good God. It is God's hearts that all be saved. And not one falls short of the glory of God. Not one. Hell was never made for humans. Hell was not made for human beings. Human beings were not supposed to go to hell. Hell was made, well, hell must be really small. If it was made just for the angels that fell and Lucifer. So that means those that are going to hell are going to be really irritable because you're going to be on top of each other, gnashing and grinding teeth, and you're going to be miserable. And God doesn't want anyone going there. So therefore, we need to preach the gospel. And we, should, we want to preach the gospel because we don't want hell getting bigger. Are you hearing me? We don't want it to have to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger because so many people are going there. You and I have the power to change that situation by being a light in darkness. And he didn't give this to the angels to preach because if he would have, they'd have got it done. So I'm going to say that again. Verse 5. For, for he has not put the worlds to come, which is heaven, of which we're speaking, in the subjection of angels. But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man that you were so mindful of him or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor and set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. So God wants you to know that he wants you and I to to really step out and do the work. And God has angels on assignment to work with us. Okay? He doesn't want us to do this alone. You and I preach the gospel, but the angels can do great things. I'll give you an example. Most of you know this story. Paul and Silas were told by the Holy Spirit to go a different direction. They were going one way, and the Holy Spirit told them, nope, don't go that way. Go a different way. Go to Macedonia. So they end up being, they obeyed. That's the secret if you want to be used of God. Obey. If you remember two words out of everything I've said tonight, hear God and obey. That's it. If you hear God accurately and he tells you to do something, you obey him. He will take care of everything. He'll get you the people to do the work. He'll bring you the right connections. He'll bring you the finances. He will do it because it's his word and he will confirm his word always. So just be obedient. So anyway, God wants you and I to be obedient always to the word of God. Well, let me think for a second. So, when we move and have our being in Christ Jesus, we will always see miracles. Paul and Silas were told to go in a different direction. They obeyed. They ended up witnessing down by the riverside. Then they cast a fortune teller, got a fortune teller free, and they ended up in jail. Now, I want to show you how the angels worked with Paul and Silas. When Paul and Silas were singing songs and worshiping God in the jail, not complaining, worshiping God in the jail, the jail shook. Do you remember that? There was an earthquake and the jail shook. And all the prison doors were opened. 
And when all the prison doors are open, the prisoners, if you've ever been to a jail, they're going to run away. When the jails are open, they're going to take off like a bullet. But when they went to move, they couldn't move because the angels held them still. Though the chains had been taken off their shackles, though the doors all flew open, those, angel, those, those prisoners could not move because the angels held them so that Paul could preach the gospel. When the, all the apostles ended up in prison for preaching the gospel because they were told not to preach the gospel anymore, the angel of the Lord came and opened the prison door and took all the apostles out and said, go out and preach this Zoe gospel. Go preach the gospel. The angels will do other stuff around us to protect us if somebody's trying to hurt us. They'll, they'll put people in position for, for us to be in connection with them, but they cannot preach the gospel. Only you, human beings, are the only ones that God has chosen to preach his word. And he didn't tell you to preach it without power. He said, I'm going to give you all power, all might, all authority to preach my gospel. Look what it says. Go with me over to Hebrews 2, 16. 2, 16. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but does give aid to to the seeds of Abraham. How many of you are the seed of Abraham? Yeah, we are. We're all the seeds of Abraham. Remember, Jesus promised that Abraham's seeds would be so numerous that you couldn't count the stars and all the sand on the sea, and we are the seeds of Abraham. So he says, he doesn't give aid to angels. God doesn't give aid to angels. They don't need our help. But he gives aid to help the seed of Abraham if they preach the gospel. He's going to have people on assignment. God's going to be there. The Holy Spirit's going to be there. God will work all things together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose and plan. You don't need to be afraid of anything. God wants to use you. Go with me to Hebrews. Go with me to Hebrews um, chapter. Ten. Hebrews chapter ten. We see and know that the end is coming. How many of you know the end's coming? How many of you know that in your Holy Spirit? Those of you watching by TV, if you've seen anything on the news lately, it's coming. There's droughts, there's famines, there's false prophets, false teachers, crazy people, parents, parents killing kids, and kids killing parents. Everything that you read about, it's happening. Where was it I was just at the other day? Oh, no corn. Corn crops, no rain in, they got the state right. It's not where the corn should be. The corn should be in Nebraska, Kansas City, somewhere in Kansas. Anyway, I don't know if I got that right. It doesn't matter. What I'm trying to say is there's not been enough rain for corn crops for six years. They have not had hardly any rain, enough to produce corn. What is that? That's a drought. We have other places where it's freezing, where it shouldn't be freezing, that is destroying crops. What is going to happen if things like that keep happening? What it says in Revelations. Yep, it says that you'll pay so much money just to get a barrel of wheat. Food prices will be off the charts. Are you hearing me? So we, and I'm not saying this to put fear on anybody, because the Bible says the righteous shall never be forsaken, nor his seed baked for bread. So you don't need to go stockpile, you know, two warehouses full of stuff. I'm just letting you know. God wants to feed you manna. He can drop manna on you. He can give you carrots. He can give you corn, even if the corn isn't producing. Um, if he wants to, he can just drop this whole room full of corn because when we pray and believe that what we ask shall be done it will be done you know what god is trying to get the church to do is yeah we're going into revelations we're coming into the end he's trying to get the church us you and me you watching all of us here me all of us 
to have faith, to have our faith so big that we are not afraid of anything. We're not afraid of any devil. We're not afraid of the economy. We're not afraid of anything because we are not of this world. We are not part of this world. Our kingdom is of heaven and there is no drought in heaven. There's no poverty in heaven. There's no sickness in heaven. God is not sitting on the throne going, oh my God, what's happening? God is not worried. Therefore, we don't need to be worried. We need to trust him, know him, love him, preach his gospel. It says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. That's number one. Not your stuff. Not what you want. Like Pastor Yeager said. Being an evangelist has a definitely different lifestyle. Because you never know where you're going to sleep, who you're going to even be sleeping with sometimes. And now you're saying, what's that? No, I'm going to share this story. Crazy story. Went to uh, some meeting over in uh, Tulsa. And the Holy Spirit told me to donate to go to two churches because they were new churches just getting started. And somebody gave each of those churches 100 chairs. And they said they just started. Well, then I saw a vision of 100 chairs empty. And all of a sudden, without me even realizing it, the next thing I knew, I was standing up on my feet and the man in charge said, what is it? sister over here and I said uh, came out of my mouth so fast I was like whoa I said I am going to volunteer to go to wherever that pastor is over there and I don't know where they are and help him fill all hundred chairs and then I'm gonna come over and help that pastor over there help you fill all your hundred chairs and uh, I'll pay all my own expenses all of that came out of my mouth real quick and then I sat down and went oh my god I wonder where these churches are. I mean, they could have been anywhere in the world. It was a big convention. Then I go, gee, I've got to buy airfares. And then I've got to do this, and I've got to do that. So all of a sudden, reality hit me. But within two seconds, somebody over here stood up and said, yes. And the guy on charge says, yep, what is it you want? He said, where's that lady that's going to volunteer oh, a couple of weeks with that one and a week or so with that one to help them fill those chairs? And they said, where are you, lady? Stand up. So I stood back up. And he goes, I'm buying her tickets for both of those places. And then I sat back down, and sure enough, he came over and gave me the ticket money. Then somebody else stood up. Where's that? And, you know, it was in between stuff. Other people were standing up for other things pretty soon. Somebody said, where's that lady again? And so the guy says, where's that lady again that's going to go help these two churches? Where are you? So I stood up. I mean, everybody was getting to know me, just standing up and down and up and down. And so I stood back up, and he goes, I don't know if anybody, so this pastor over here says, I don't know if anybody realizes she just donated her time. I'm sure she's an evangelist and needs to make money. We're going to take up offerings and take care of your offerings for the week you're at that church, and maybe some other pastor can help some other. And all of a sudden, another person stood up and said, we'll take care of it for the other church. And I was like, God, you are good. You are good. So why do we worry? Why do we worry? God wants us to trust him. No matter what happens, God will take care of everything. When you hear God, don't worry. Although I got in a little flesh, I sat down and I'm like, oh my God, wonder where they are. And I was talking about you sometimes sleep with people that you don't know about. That's where I was coming with this, right? And so I went to the first church. It was in Zania, Ohio. Had some great services. And the next one was in uh, Broken Arrow, Arizona. No, uh, yeah, Oklahoma. Broken, broken, it was too, not too far from Tulsa. Anyway, so Broken Era, um, Oklahoma. And so when I get there, it's a new church. You know, sometimes new pastors don't know quite how to take care of evangelists. Right? They're just too new. I mean, this guy has like 20 people in his church. And so he says, here's your bedroom, Sister Joan. You're staying at our house. Fine. And so I, I, you know, get in bed and I go to bed early on Saturday nights because I get up real, real early, like 3 in the morning, and pray for Sunday morning services. And um, I get in bed. 
and I'm almost asleep. And all of a sudden, this girl comes in, changes her clothes, gets her nightgown on, and says, scoot over, Sister Joan. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm sleeping with a total stranger that I just met at the airport a few hours ago. And she goes, and she's only 15. And so at the headboard, she has this, you know, stereo. And she cranks it on, like, really loud on real, I mean, Christian music, but it's boom, 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 boom. And she says, you don't mind if I sleep with the stereo on all night? And I says, yeah, actually, I think, you'd, I think you need to go get your dad. Would you go get your dad? I'm getting my robe on. And I went out and I says, um, look, I'm going to wake up at 3 in the morning to be praying for your service. And I, um, you, I'll sleep on the sofa if you want me to. So what I'm saying is an evangelist's life can be strange. That's the only time I had to sleep with somebody. Think, well, no, that's not true, that I didn't know. Because on mission trips, you know, one time on mission trips in New York, I had 54 people on the mission trip. 54. The church put all the men upstairs. 31 women downstairs in the basement, all on air mattresses, all in sync. <laughs> Ten days of it. And if you know anything about 31 women all sleeping on the same floor with four showers. Joan Pierce had to say to everybody, nicely, shut up. Go to sleep. It's one o'clock in the morning. We have a crusade in the morning in the park. We have to set up for at six in the morning. Be quiet. Stop talking to each other. Because they will talk all night. Oh, yes. And I'm going to be staying with Kathy for the next three days, too. Yes. That's okay. I love you, Kathy. I know. I've been with her. Anyway, what I'm saying is, God, listen to me, all joking aside, God is saying it's not easy to preach this gospel. There's things you have to pay a price. There's things you have to do. If God tells you to bring a family into your home and disciple them and love them until they come in the kingdom, you never know what God's going to ask you to do, so you just learn to obey and know you're not doing it by yourself, that you're doing it with the help of God. And God is helping you do everything. Hebrews chapter 10, and it says in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holy holiness by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil of, that, of his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from evil consciousness and our bodies washed with the pure word. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. we got to trust God. And let us consider one another to stir up love and good works. Verse 25, do you believe the end is coming? Pastor Yeager, I want to say this to you. The Bible says, and I'll read it first. It says, not forsaking of the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Are you hearing me? Okay. Pastor Yeager got a word from God. All of you pastors that are listening, you need to hook up with Pastor Yeager. I'm telling you, I don't care where you are, what country you're in, you need to hook up because he is hearing from God. Some pastors, and I'm not picking on pastors, please don't all email me immediately. But if you want to talk with me, call me. Okay. Some pastors have... Well, we're not having Sunday night meetings anymore because nobody will come. 
Well, pretty soon you aren't going to have Wednesday night meetings because nobody's going to come. What are you going to do? Shut down Sunday morning services because nobody will come? What? The Bible says have more meetings as you see the end approaching. Assemble yourself more often, not less often. When you start assembling less often, you're giving place to the devil because people cannot live a spiritual life and be fruitful and preach the gospel when they only get a one-hour meal a week. They can't make it. We need one another. We need to encourage one another, stir up the gifts in one another, work with one another, love one another. And if you don't see each other, how do you know if somebody's hurting? And then we need to be real. We're not me phonies. My husband paid me the neatest compliment the other day. He said, you know what I love about you, hon? I said, what? He said, you know, I thought he would say something. I have a cute, cute smile, you know, something. What? And he says that, too. He calls, he just, I, I've never seen a husband that just constantly stares at me and says, you're so beautiful. And I go, and I look in the mirror and I go, like, I don't know what he sees. You know, I just figure that when he married me, that God must have done like sprinkle dust on him or something, you know, and and, he, and so he just fell in love with me like, ch -ch 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 -ch. and I don't know what he sees, but anyway, and then if I say that, he gets mad at me. He says, "Don't even, don't even go there." But anyway, he said, "I love about you." He said, oh, "You know what I love about you?" I said, "What?" He says, "You're real." I said, "Well, of course I'm real." And he says, "No," he says. You preach from the pulpit, and you live what you preach. You don't preach this message, and then you live different than what you preach. What you preach to other people, and what you preach from the pulpit, you live. Because I'm with you 24-7, and I see. That doesn't mean you don't have some flaws, but we all have flaws. But he says you live what you preach. You see... If we get it in us, the Jaegerts live what they preach. Everybody that's ever been on a mission trip, anyone that's come to the schools here that we've done here at your church, people from all over that have come here and stayed on these grounds, go, that family, that family, the Jaegerts, is so in love with God. I've not seen too many families I mean, I get to go all over and see with pastors' families, but I haven't seen too many families like your family, and that's the truth. Because you live it, you preach. Oh, that don't mean that you don't have your days when you yell and scream. No, oh, we're human. Can't be in the spirit 24-7. I mean, you should be, but, you know, every now and then, the flesh comes out. And it comes out so fast that you just go like, oh, where'd that come from? And you try to take it back. You know, I, I'll just share this story. Um, I'm staying really close to this church, and I won't say names, but I'm staying real close to this church and just getting to know this pastor really well, which I haven't really known really well, although I've preached in his church for like 20-something years, but never really got to know him because he's just like busy all the time and never get to spend any time with him. But now that I'm right there close on the grounds doing some work and we've hooked up to do a huge outreach this year, we're, we're expecting about 2,000 people to show up. And uh, Marty and I are going to spearhead it. But anyway, um, it was so funny because I was in a board meeting with him last week. And he goes, Did, was you at church to hear me Wednesday night? I said, I'm never here. I'm gone all over the world. And he goes, oh, yeah. He said, Joan, have you ever preached things that you wish you could have just caught those words later and went, <laughs> and bring them right back in? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, I said some things that after the service, I was like, oh, I wish I hadn't have done that. And I wish I hadn't have done that. And I wish I hadn't have said that. And I go, are you kidding? I said, you mean put your foot in your mouth? I said, I do that quite often. I said, that's just part of life. Sometimes you get off on some story, and then later your husband and your wife says, I wish you wouldn't tell that story no more, you know, or whatever. But we're, we're human beings. But watch. So we're to assemble ourselves more often. And then it says... Verse 25 again, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some, but exhorting one another so much more. We need to help one another, encourage one another so much more when we see the end day approaching. For if we sin willfully 
after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Now we can get forgiven, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fearful expectation which endeavors the, what's the next word? Adversaries. Where was I going with this? Hold on. There was some scripture I wanted to put in here. Hold on. This is not there. Anyway, go, oh, there it is. Okay, go with, with me to verse 35. Go with me to verse 35. And my notes were a little scribbly here. But it's okay. See, you can even mess up and be on TV all around the world. Because God isn't looking for perfect people. He's just looking for people that says, I'm willing. Use me. So people will be saved or I'll die. Because if I can't be useful here on earth, then just take me home. If you can't use me, God, to advance the kingdom, to see people saved, to see people fed, to see children taken care of, then I don't want to be here. I want to finish my course like Paul. I want to finish the race and do everything you've called me to do, and I want to do it with the best that I know how. Not sloppy, but do it the best I know how, and that's what God wants of you. And so what happens, listen to me, pastors, people, ch people here, people all watching, the devil's a creep. The devil is a creep. You need to understand that the devil is a creep. And he will try to get you discouraged. Are you hearing me? Some of you here are discouraged. Some of you watching by TV are discouraged. And what the devil wants to do is he wants to get you discouraged. Well, you are doing this right, and you are doing this right, and you didn't do that right, and you didn't do that right. Tell the devil to shut up. He'll work on you. And if he knows you have flaws in your past and you did something really bad 10 years ago, 20 years ago, he's forever going, well, see, I'm not, God's not using you because of what you did 25 years ago. And God's not using you because of what you did two months ago. Just if you mess up, say, I'm sorry, God. Look at David. David messed up. Got a lady pregnant, wasn't even married. Well, I guess, did, no, he wasn't married to her. And then got the husband killed. A murderer and an adulteress. And yet he said, he's a man after my own heart. Doesn't mean you can't fall into sin or do something wrong, but be quick to repent. And don't practice it. And don't deliberately sin. Try to live holy. Try to have everything be godly, holy. Try to lead as many people. Try to worship God so you're so full of the presence of God that you spend time in his presence, that, that you are sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, and when you start talking to people, they'll start weeping and crying and call on the name of Jesus. I'm so excited about this year. I'm excited about every year. I just, I, I just stay excited. You know, I always thought that might go away someday, but, you know, it has never gone away. I just am so excited, and, and I never get tired of mission trips, and I never get tired of preaching. In fact, if I'm home very long, in fact, Marty and I are kind of crazy. Actually, we're kind of crazy. If we're more ho home more than a day or two from traveling somewhere or doing something, we're bored, and we think we need to go on a trip. So sometimes when I have too long a period of time, if I have a week off or 10 days off, we'll just go on a trip just because we're so used to going on trips that we just need to pack and do something. It's crazy. But Marty's telling me now a little more often, we need to stay home and kind of rest. I go, <sighs> I do. After the first day, I rest. And then the next day, I'm bored. That's it. I like to be busy. So everyone can get discouraged. Joan Pierce can get discouraged. Marty Pierce can get discouraged. Everyone can get discouraged. But this is what we got to set in our heart. Verse 35. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, 
which is with great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Verse 37. For yet a little while, and he who comes is coming will come and will not tarry. Jesus is going to come. Sooner or later, Jesus is going to come in the clouds as king of kings and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul takes no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but to those who believe to the saving of the soul. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. God wants you and I to walk in faith and trust him that if he said we have everything we need to preach this gospel, that we have all the power, all the gifts, all the knowledge, all the authority to tell the devils where to go and stand in the gap and pray and fast on behalf of somebody's salvation. He's empowered us and we have to have faith because without faith, it's impossible to please God because you have to activate your faith. You might have all these gifts like I said earlier. You might have dynamite in here. But if you don't strike the match to the dynamite, it's just going to sit there. So we need to take and activate God's word, praying for the sick, casting out devils, expecting miracles, leading people to the Lord. It's not going to happen if we don't step out and start talking to people, seeing somebody with a neck brace saying, could I pray for you? Seeing people that are bound by something and saying, can I pray that the Lord sets you free? Lay, lay. Lately, we've been just casting out devils and services. Last night, I preached over, what did I preach? Not last night, the night before. I preached over in um, Hagerstown, and right in the middle of my preaching, I just kept calling people out right in the middle of my preaching. And this lady and her husband, and the next thing I knew, they're in the middle of the hallway, in the middle of the aisle, and we're just casting devils out of them. And everybody in the whole church just, you know, just, don't worry about what I'm doing, church. Just <laughs> So the whole church watched, and she got set free. We have to have the power to set people free. There are people that have things holding them in bondage, and we need to have the power to set them free. And that's only going to be done when you activate your faith and step out. And it says in 11.6, Hebrew 11.6, for without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to Jesus must believe that he is, and he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. So you seek God with all your heart, with all your might, with all your soul. You want to be a soul winner? You want to see miracles? You want to see the supernatural? Seek God. Believe God and step out. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 12. There's a whole bunch of people that have gone before us. Hebrews 12, 1, therefore, we also are surrounded by, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto, verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, whom for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and, what, and has sat down at the right hand of the God, uh, hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. And God is saying to you and I, don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged at what you see. Don't get discouraged, pastors that are across the country. Don't get discouraged if one Sunday you say, wow, there's just a handful here. Don't get discouraged. Keep the faith. Keep the faith. If you have a big church, and your associate pastor just run off with half the people. 
keep the faith. If you're a saint of God and you're going through some hard times right now, Right now, I'm speaking to two ladies, and you have been, your husbands have had an affair, you're broken, you don't know which way to turn, keep the faith. Don't get discouraged. God will take care of it. There's some people that are sick. Right now, there's a, can a lady with cancer, tumor, another lady with a tumor, and people with back aches. Don't get discouraged. Only believe, only believe, because Jesus wants you to know that he is the author and the finisher. He will not leave you on chapter 2 or chapter 10. He'll bring you all the way to completion, to healing. Right now, there's some people here. Put a praise tape on. I had a few more scriptures, but the Lord told me to start ministering. Just follow the Holy Spirit. There's some people here that have been having problems. There's somebody here that has a low thyroid, and you've been having, you've been tired. Somebody that's been constantly getting fatigued all the time. Whoever that is, come on up. There's somebody else here that's been having some trouble with kidneys. Have you been having some problems right here with pain in your back? Are you having problems with your kidneys? But you feel throbbing right through here a lot? And the lower part of your back, some problems? Come up. There's somebody here that's been having problems with your eyes. Your eye, one eye twitches. Whoever that is, come on up. There's somebody else that's been having problems with a shoulder. It's your shoulder has been hurting you. And when you do that, it's just really painful. There's somebody else that's been having problems with the knee. There's somebody else that's been having problems with arthritis and rheumatism. Your joints. Come on up. God is able. God is able. Right now, the Holy Spirit told me there's several people here that are struggling with finances. So those of you that are struggling with finances, come over and stand over here. Some of you are having struggling with finances right now. Put your hands up to the Lord. Is there anyone else sick in body right now? Anyone else sick in body that needs prayer? Just come on up right now. If there's anyone else that needs prayer, just come on up right now because the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God. Sometimes your miracle is from where you're sitting up to the altar and God wants to activate your faith. He wants to see your faith that you will move to the front. Sure, he can heal you where you are, but he wants to see your faith in action. Put your hands up to the Lord. Whatever you need from God, he's a big, big God. He is able. God is not in poverty. There's no sickness in heaven. There's no diseases in heaven. God can take care of every problem you have. Anyone that's discouraged, God wants to encourage you. 